Excellent singing, and uh, I want to just invite you to uh, bow your head and pray with me before we sit. Lord, we, we just want to respond to the lyrics that we have just sung by expressing our, our need for those lyrics, our need to believe those truths. We, we long to hasten the day of your return. We long for your kingdom to be shown on earth. We long for you to get the glory that you so richly deserve. Um, we long for that in a global sense, but Lord, I think we would be reticent to pray that if we were not also longing for that in our own hearts. If we do not long for you to get glory, all glory in our own hearts, then we will not long for the day of your return. The day of your reckoning would be terrifying. The day of you getting exclusive glory on earth would not be attractive. Heaven would hold no joy for us because it is radically centered around you. And so, Lord, as we think about the salvation that you alone can give, it delivers us from the dominion of sin. It deliv delivers us from guilt. It delivers us from um, idolatry. It delivers us from unbiblical thinking. It delivers us from unbiblical living and it enables us to lift up our soul to you with full joy, with complete joy, um, with no regrets. And so, Lord, I pray that these lyrics would be lived out in our lives this week. I pray that these lyrics would be uh, really an appropriate epitaph on our, on our entire life. And so, as, as your church, corporately, we just want to thank you for the rich privilege of gathering on the Lord's Day to sing these lyrics to you as we edify and encourage one another around us. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Grab your Bible and we're going to continue in our study of the Gospel of Mark this morning. We're going to look at Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Authority to forgive sins. That's really the title of this narrative, 12 verses, and it's probably one of the most memorable healings recorded in the Gospels, and with good reason. Just a few minutes ago, um, Scott mentioned in his devotion before communion, he mentioned something along the lines of this statement, think about the magnitude of your sin, and think about the magnitude and the weight of the wrath of God do for one single act of sin. Uh, as man, as sinners, we can never lose sight of how personal our sins are. They are personally committed, and they are personally offensive to God. They are personally offensive to Him. Our sins are acts that actually despise God. They actually reveal in our inner man that we do not think as highly of God as we ought to. And every act of sin is a, a manifestation that we, are, that we have remaining in us still some area of rebellion or unbelief. We might even say it this way, that if I sin and despise God, it's actually an attempt to put Him in a position that He never inhabits, which is a position under my scrutiny and judgment. I want to just, before we dive into Mark 2, I want to just remind you of a few simple truths. These are truths that are throughout the scripture. Namely, if the sins that we commit against God are so personally offensive against Him, if our crime is against Him, where else could we go for forgiveness except to God Himself? Isaiah chapter 1, the prophet starts out in verse 2 saying this, Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks. Sons I have reared and brought up, but they have revolted against me. An ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master's manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. And he compares the people of God to the, the folly of even... Um, Animals that know their own owner, the, the people of God actually do not. And why? It's because of their sin. Verse 4, Alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, 
offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from Him. Their sin means they have despised God and turned away from Him. And of course, Israel is not in the habit of abandoning worship in the temple. They continue worshiping in the temple, and that's actually the very problem. Skip down to verse 11. God says through the prophet Isaiah, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me? So while the nation is sinning against God, they are still continuing to offer worship in the external fashion that God had prescribed. And he says, I have had enough of burnt offerings and of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me, and I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. It should be pretty clear that no matter what we do, no matter what we offer, no matter what work we perform, even when the catalog of lists of works that we would offer to God are the very ones he prescribes that could not possibly merit forgiveness. Listen to Jeremiah. He says it quite quite succinctly. He, He puts the nature of sin in such personal terms because he just gives us God's perspective on our sins. And so I'm really, when it comes to forgiveness and the forgiveness of sins, there's no more important question to ask than what's the perspective of our sins from God's vantage point? Jeremiah chapter 2, thus says the Lord, what injustice did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and walked after emptiness, and became empty. This is a a challenge to the sinner, that we could know God, and know his word, and know his revelation. And here, it's an apostate nation that actually has turned from God. And so God's sitting there, and he sees that. He takes that personally as a personal offense, because it is. When God takes sin as a personal offense, he's not overreacting. He's not having a temper tantrum. It is a personal offense against God. And he's sitting there saying, what injustice did you find in me? What did I do wrong that you found me unsuitable as your God, as your worthy, your object of worship, that you would actually go after emptiness and then become empty yourselves? And it's true, you become like what you worship. And so in the act of idolatry, these people became empty. Skip down to verse 12. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 12. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. And shudder, be very desolate, declares the Lord. Because my people have committed two evils. Two evils. And you you might think he's going to describe two radically different evils. They are perhaps the same action, but they are two evils and two evil aspects of the same action. Here's what they are. Number one, they have forsaken me. They've forsaken God. The fountain of living waters... And here's number two. To hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. So in the word of verse 5, it's they pursued emptiness, became empty themselves. In the word of verse 13, they actually forsook God, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves their own man-made cisterns that were broken, couldn't hold any water, and are absolutely completely destitute of any spiritual value or benefit. Skip down to verse 19. Jeremiah says this, and this is, again, God speaking through Jeremiah, so we're still getting God's perspective on our own sin and how bad it really is. Your own wickedness will correct you, and your apostasies will reprove you. Know, therefore, and see that it is evil and bitter for you to forsake the Lord your God, and the dread of me is not in you, declares the Lord God of hosts. He makes it very clear that any act of sin, apostasy, infidelity to the Lord is wicked, it's evil, it's bitter, and it's rooted in a lack of fear of God. We don't dread God, we don't fear his response, we don't fear what he thinks of us, and we commit 
sin, and it's called apostasies, wickedness, which is, by its very definition, evil and bitter. In fact, we might say it this way, to sin against God is actually to attempt to spite him, to spite God. And we don't use that terminology a ton, and and perhaps it's appropriate to do so. Look at Jeremiah chapter 7 for a second. Jeremiah chapter 7 uses this terminology of our sin against God. In verse um, 17, Jeremiah is speaking to the people again. Do you not see what they are doing in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem? Verse 18. The children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods in order to spite me. And that, that word is similar. And so that's a very good translation because the Hebrew word means to provoke to anger, to cause anger. The English word just means to um, attempt to hurt, offend, or cause harm, to deliberately hurt or annoy. Annoy would be certainly too weak in this context. Verse 19, do they spite me, declares the Lord? Is it not themselves they spite to their own shame? And when you think about the nature of sin, nature of sin is in the heart an attempt to hurt God, harm God, spite God, slight God, despise him, and you cannot possibly actually pull it off. <laughs> no sinner has ever hurt God. No sinner has ever put God in a position of disadvantage. All you can only do is spite yourself. But the reason I showed you these three texts is because they, they are helpful, and we could go to, literally, we could go to hundreds of texts to prove the same point. Our sin against God is very personal. If, if we have sinned against the one true God, and we have, we have put ourselves in a horrible situation. To think about standing guilty before God, having crimes committed against God, we've committed high treason against the the king of the universe. To imagine of, you know, the thought of having those crimes expunged from our record seems impossible. In fact, nobody can do it but God himself. One, One more text, let me just show you Psalm 130. Verse 3 and 4, it's very familiar to many of you. In Psalm 130, we read, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? I mean, if God took every iniquity, every act of perversion committed against his name, and he marked them down, he kept record, he put it all on our record, locked it up in the cosmic courthouse, and there is no law of expungement. There is no ability to remove any misdemeanor or felony from our record. If God kept all of those marked down, didn't remove any of them, oh Lord, who could stand? Obviously the answer is no one. No one can stand on the day of judgment. Verse 4, but there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Wait a minute. There's forgiveness with God that, that he may be feared. This is a fear, as we've talked about here before, this is a fear that's not the fear that drives you away from God, it's a fear that drives you toward God. It's a fear of messing things up worse because there's actually a possibility of forgiveness, there's actually a possibility of reconciliation, there's actually a possibility of relationship with a God formerly offended. But the point is, in verse 4a, is that forgiveness is with You, God. Irenaeus, the church father, asked this question, how can sins be rightly remitted unless the very one against whom one has sinned grants the pardon? No one can grant pardon for sins against someone else. There's no authority. I remember one time, a tragic, a tragic uh, scenario where there was a dear friend who, who um, uh, had, had left our church and, and um, he, he withdrew his membership and, and he, he'd made it very clear. He said, I don't, I don't want you um, as my pastor anymore. And um, he was working with an organization and that organization wanted him to go back to his pastor for some approval for something. 
And so he called me up six months later and said, hey, would you approve of this and this and this uh, move in ministry? And I said, well, friend, I mean, look, you've you got to ask your pastor. Well, yeah, but I need to ask you. But I don't, friend, I don't have any authority. And he didn't understand the lack of authority. I'm like, I'm just a man trying to serve Christ, I hope, like you. But asking me for approval for some ministry initiative would be like asking for France for an extension on your taxes. <laughs> I, I don't, what, what, what am I missing here? There's no authority. And that's what's so powerful and so sweet about this story about Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 2. What's so shocking is to see a man walking on earth claiming to have the authority to forgive sins against God. This is profound. The story we're about to read either demands that Jesus is the Son of God himself, or he is a liar. There are no two options. I want to read chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, and I'm going to invite you to follow along with me. When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, and it was heard that he was at home, and many were gathered at the door, or, sorry, many were gathered together, so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak this way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, uh, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we've never seen anything like this before. Well, this is a powerful story. Even apart from the point of the story being Jesus' authority to forgive sins, it's a powerful story. It unfolds in two simple halves, if you will, verses 1 through 5. Really, it's the, the whole point of that first half of the story is Jesus declares to have the authority to forgive sins. And then in verses 6 to 12, he demonstrates it beyond any shadow of a doubt. He actually does have authority to forgive sins. And so let's just look at each half and just walk right through this story. It unfolds very easily. So verse 1, he had come back to Capernaum. And you remember where we left off. He just healed a leper in verses 40 to 45 of chapter 1. And the leper was told, you know, here's what you need to do. According to the book of Leviticus, here's the offerings you need to offer in the temple. And that's going to be a witness and testimony um, uh, to the, the religious elite that you were healed. And he doesn't. Not only does he not go to the temple and, he, and, and do the sacrifices, he actually doesn't even do what Jesus said at all. Jesus said, be quiet, don't tell anyone anything. And he just instead went out and started telling everybody. In verse 45, at the end of that verse, it says that uh, he, he actually, the news spread so quickly and so rapidly to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city. So he actually lost the ability to some degree to preach and teach with the capacity that he wanted to. Now, he continued to preach and teach, and that's actually proven even in our own story, as we'll see in verse 2. But in verse 45, it just makes the point that he couldn't even go into the cities. 
uh, the, the, the curiosity seekers and the self-loving populace uh, m- prevented him from being able to preach in those populated areas. So his preaching ministry was largely out in unpopulated areas. And interestingly enough, that's literally even like uh, desolate places or places in the wilderness. Wilderness locations would be like a literal translation there. So he's out in the wilderness, comes back to Capernaum, and now it's several days later, and it was heard that he was at home, and, and most likely because of the way Mark started his gospel, this is probably back at Simon Peter's house, Simon Peter's house becomes kind of headquarters. It's, it's his house, not, not that he owns it, just that's his headquarters, that's where his local ministry is rooted out of. And so most likely when Mark says he was at home, he's back in Peter's house where the miracle was performed back in chapter 1 where he healed Peter's mother-in-law. Verse 2 Many were gathered together so that there was no longer room. And so you say, oh, okay, I know what it's like. You go over to someone's small group and there's no more room, like we're out of chairs. No, there's no longer room. We're not talking about chairs. We're not talking about a place to sit. We're talking about a place to stand, a place to breathe. We're talking about enough room to exhale, get some more lung air in your capacity. I mean, it's like people are packed all the way to the door. You can't fit anyone in there. And so... Verse 2 ends with the summary statement, and Jesus was speaking the word to them. And he just wants to continue to make the point that to make sense of this story, you got to remember Jesus is, again, preaching the word. That's his priority, and that's what he came to do. So there he is. He's preaching the word. We should not be surprised. Verse 3 introduces these players, four men carrying a fifth, the paralytic, and they probably have all four corners of his, of his pallet or, or bedroll. It's just a, a word that just means little, little bed, little mattress. Verse 4, being unable to get to him, um, because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And so they don't, you know, Mark doesn't really fill in the details about how they got up there. They just, they just realize we're not even getting through the door. We're not even getting into the threshold. There's not even room to get in there. This is an impossible scenario. So they just go up on the roof. However they got there, it doesn't even matter. And it's interesting, his, his verbiage here is, uh, it's translated, they removed the roof. And, and it's a word that would be like the verb for, the, the, the root of the verb is the same root as the word for roof. And so a, a, like a literal translation, I think this is a good way to hear it, they literally unroofed the roof. They unroof the roof to get to Jesus. And what's interesting about this is the amount of work that it took. Um, all it says here is that when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And, you know, certainly uh, some commentators speculate, well, here's a few options of how this house could have been constructed. It might have just been nothing more than thatch and, and some mud on top. But we actually know it was much much more robust. It was a very well-built house. Uh, not every house in, these, in those days would have had tile roofs. Some did, and certainly this one does. The parallel in Luke 5.19 actually says that they had tiles. And so the, the word tile in Greek is keramos, where we, we, you can hear our word ceramic. Uh, but keramos in Greek would be a little bit more like, um, our, like our Spanish tile. It's like a terracotta, it's an earthenware, it's a jar, it's a clay pot. Uh, and so it's that kind of material they would create tiles out of. So they they pull out the tiles, they dig through the material of the roof. So to put it in um, Arizona vernacular, they're popping off the Spanish tiles, they get the skill saw, the battery-powered skill saw, they're cutting through the, the plywood, they're slipping between trusses, they get down just, may, maybe they were thoughtful enough to move the three feet of insulation out of the way, and then cut through the drywall, and then they just start lowering them down. This is a tremendous amount of work. It's a tremendous cost to the structure. Verse 5 is not surprising. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, your son, your sins are forgiven. This is faith on display. Faith, as you know, is active. You know, and so... We, we get a little confused about that today because, you know, we, 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 like, we, we live in a culture where people are people of faith. And that just means they have some sort of conviction about some cosmic reality or afterlife that they think is meaningful to them. But biblical faith is active. And if you go back, if you go through, off the top of my head, if you go back through Hebrews chapter 11, the, chapter, the faith chapter, the hall of faith, I think you'll find 39 active verbs about what faith produced in the lives of faithful people. 
By faith they did this. By faith they did this. By faith they did this. And here, faith is on display. Now, I just want to be really, really careful and make one quick comment. The statement, son, your sins are forgiven, is singular, and it's spoken to the paralytic specifically. It's interesting that their faith in verse 5a is plural. So Mark is actually documenting that the four who were carrying the paralytic had faith in Jesus' ability to heal, and they actually believed this man can heal our friend. And that's the extent that we know about those four and their faith. I, I couldn't prove or disprove whether they believed in Christ in the sense that they knew they needed cleansing, a la John's baptism, they knew that they needed repentance. I don't know. All we can say for sure about the four is the same thing that could be said of the two blind men. Remember that a couple weeks ago? We looked at Mark, Matthew chapter 9. Just, you don't have to turn here. Just listen real quick. Matthew chapter 9 records the healing of two individuals who respond the same as our leper from chapter 1. In other words, a legitimate healing, all of Jesus' healings were legitimate, a legitimate healing followed with unbelief, disobedience, and a lack of submission to Christ's words. Here in Matthew 9, there's two blind men, and they're crying out, have mercy on us, son of David. He enters the house, blind men came up to him and said, uh, do you believe? He said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? They said, yes, Lord. He touched their eyes, saying, it shall be done to you according to your faith. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, see to it that no one knows about this. But they went out and split, spread the news everywhere throughout the whole land. They were not lacking faith in Jesus' ability to heal, but they did not have faith in Christ's person. They didn't have faith in his words. They didn't submit to his message. They didn't do what Jesus asked them to do. With these four, they clearly have at least that faith. We don't know if it's more. What we do know is that there is a singular statement made exclusively to the paralytic, and the paralytic receives this statement from Jesus, son, your singular, sins, plural, are forgiven. I mean, we go five verses into the story to finally reach the climax of the first half, the first little action sequence. After all of that, after all of that demo work on the roof, <laughs> after all of that drama of some of the most powerful preaching known to mankind, Jesus opening up the word, speaking his message from God in human form, finally a fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18. I mean, cosmic realities are happening. He's preaching in this house. It's packed to the hilt. After the demo work, they get him down there. And he says, your sins are forgiven. He doesn't say anything about penance. He doesn't say anything about suffering on the part of the sinner. And certainly no modern-day exhortation to forgive yourself. He authoritatively pronounces it done. Your sins are forgiven. Sins are, are not mere mistakes. They're, they're, they're missing the mark of God's standard. Violation of God's will. It's falling short of God's will. It's committing acts that he's told you not to commit. It's um, avoiding acts that he's told you to commit. It's heart attitudes and heart aspects of worship and regards for God and his word that he has commanded mankind as profound as love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. The miss on that command is sin. And Jesus singularly just sits there and just says, they're gone. They have been removed. There's a record of all your crimes, all your misdemeanors, all your felonies in the cosmic courthouse. And Jesus from Nazareth, a man, pronounces them gone. That's the declaration that he has the authority to forgive sins. Is that legit? Verse 6 is an interesting, verse 6 and 7 together, these two verses are an interesting little unit of the story. 
because the way Mark tells it, this is actually just, he's just describing in an, in an offhanded way um, what we need before, before he actually gets back to the action sequence in verse 8. So verse 6 and 7, like I've described, if we have that narrator, as we're watching the movie of Mark unfold and Mark's giving us narration, well, verse 6 and 7 are narration. Here's what Mark whispers in our ear as we're watching this action sequence unfold, because we would never know if we were just watching the action sequence. No one else knew except Jesus what was happening. Verse 6, Mark's sitting there telling us as the reader, you know, and by the way, reader, just some of the scribes are sitting there, and they're reasoning in their hearts. And then he just gives us their inner monologue. Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So Mark now tells us what's going on inside their heart. And the action sequence picks right back up in verse 8. Immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way in themselves, responds to them. <laughs> now we've got to stop right there for a second. I, I just chuckle. You know, I just, can, how unnerving would that be? You know, you're at dinner and you're sitting there and thinking like, oh man, I got, my two teenagers are on their fourth portion. I wonder how much food they have left. Oh, don't worry, John. They, we've got plenty more in the fridge. You haven't even seen. Whoa. <laughs> you imagine how unnerving that would be? I mean, their inner thoughts. He just, he just starts responding to their inner monologue. It wasn't spoken. It wasn't known. It wasn't even, it wasn't whispered under their breath. It's just internal hostility against Christ rooted in skepticism. And he just responds to it. And they knew, they knew that Jesus had just exercised the prerogative of God to forgive human sin. And they're right when they say 7b, who can forgive sins but God alone? That's, that's actually right. But obviously their reasoning is fallen and depraved because they also say he is blasphemy. These are scribes. Scribes is a word that just means um, an expert, an expert in the law. They study the written writings of, of the scripture. Um, they, they study the Old Testament and they, they study the, the Torah. And, and these scribes would certainly have been familiar with the prophecy of Isaiah. And I, I want to do one thing before I finish, go back to the story here. Let me give you one more quick cross-reference. In the book of Isaiah, I think this is important because if you remember, going back to when we started the Gospel of Mark, you remember that one of the quotes that, that Mark pulls out of the Old Testament was, is Isaiah 40, verse 3. And, and that's really at the, the beginning of this prophecy that starts in chapter 40, goes all the way through 66. And, and, and Mar Isaiah 40 to 66 is a profound section of Scripture that it, it just undergirds so much of what Mark is doing. He really writes with that portion of Scripture kind of expected to be somewhat familiar. And um, one, of the, one of the words that's so common in this section of the book of Isaiah, well, there's a lot that are common that are picked up in Mark, like Holy One of Israel. We've already heard the demons say, I know who you are, the Holy One of Israel. That's, a, that's an Isaiah phrase. Here's another one. It's the very, one of the very themes of the Gospel of Mark, the way. The very prophecy he quoted in Isaiah 40, I'm going to prepare a way through the wilderness. And the way is God is coming to Jerusalem. And, and the word way is used, uh, I believe, over 40 times in the book of Isaiah. And many times it's used of God and it's his path, how he's acting. And particularly in some of these prophecies, how God becomes man and arrives personally in Jerusalem. At other times, it's the, God, the people of God following um, Yahweh on the way. Here's one that pertains to our discussion about forgiveness. And let's just pick it up in Isaiah 43. And I want to show this to you uh, because here's a, here's a way passage um, that is connected to a way and it's also connected to the wilderness. And I do not believe that it's coincidental that Mark ended chapter 1 with Jesus in the wilderness, in the desolate places. Here's Isaiah 43. Let's pick it up in verse um, 18. 
Do not call to mind the former things or ponder things of the past. Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a way. NAS has roadway there. It's just the common word derrick, which means way. I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field will glorify me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I have given waters in the wilderness and rivers to the desert to give drink to my chosen people. I mean, this is profound because he's clearly reversing the curse, and it's, 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 it's affecting the um, animal creation. It's affecting his own people. He's reversing the curse, and that's what's so profound about this way in the wilderness. There shouldn't even be a wilderness, but that's all because of the curse. Verse 21, the people whom I have formed for myself will declare my praise. Verse 22, Yet you have not called on me, O Jacob, but you have become weary of me, O Israel. You have not brought to me the sheep of your burnt offerings, nor have you honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with offerings, nor wearied you with incense. You have not brought me sweet cane with money, nor have you filled me with the fat of your sacrifices. Rather, you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. And God's describing the weariness, the burden that he bears of seeing his people heap up sin and iniquity. So verse 25 says, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgression for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. Who's speaking? Yahweh. Shouldn't be surprised in the Greek translation of verse 25. It begins, ego e me, ego e me, the very phrase that Jesus picks up 14 times in the Gospel of John. God alone forgives, and here is the Son of God on earth forgiving. Verse 8, he's aware that they're reasoning in the hearts, and he just responds to that inner monologue, and again, the, the he is blaspheming is, is a lie. That's heresy. But who can forgive sins but God alone? That's true. That's true. And so he says to them, well, so, so why are you reasoning this way? Why are you reasoning about these things in your heart? And he just starts to call them out. Now, as we're about to get to the miracle, if you can forgive, if you can heal a paralytic... That's a miracle that attests to the validity of your message. But even before we get to the miracle of the healing, there's the miracle of uh, omniscience, of uh, mind reading, of knowing the inner monologue that was never voiced, never expressed. John Chrysostom said, The scribes asserted that only God could for forgive sins, yet Jesus not only forgave sins, but showed that he also had another power that belongs to God alone, the power to disclose the secrets of the heart. That's so true. Now, don't forget about verse 8 in light of verses 9 through 12. He just reads their mind and starts responding. But here's the issue. In verse 9, he starts to set up an argument, a proof, if you will. This is the demonstration that his claim is legitimate and valid. His message is vindicated by this test that he sets up. Verse 9 is an a fortiori argument from the, from the weaker to the greater or lesser to the, the lesser to the greater, stronger to the lesser, either one, both qualify. In this case, he says, which is easier to, the, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, pick up your pallet, and walk? Which one's easier to say? Well, it's easy to say, your sins are forgiven. Well, okay. Uh... How would I know? How would you know? My sins are against God. That's pretty easy to say. Anybody can say it. Whether it's true or not is a different issue. What's harder to say is something that's actually verifiable in time and space, like saying to a paralytic, get up, your, get up take up your pallet, and walk home. And so, verse 10 Jesus says, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. Now, this is a test, a proving grounds, 
signs prove the message. Miraculous signs have always proven the message uh, all the way back to uh, Moses, all the way through to New Testament apostles. That's just always been the case. The signs and the miraculous attest to the fact that the message is true. Sometimes this gets a little confused. I once had a uh, professor, and I didn't personally have a professor, there was a professor who was teaching at a university uh, down the road where I was pastoring as a college pastor, and this professor was teaching the students uh, heresy, namely that Jesus um, gave up his deity when he became incarnate. And they said that he did not have deity, he, he was divine, he was, he was God, but now he's, he's, he, he gave up that deity. He gave up that deity, that his, his earthly ministry. That was what he was teaching the students. And so I uh, emailed him and said, hey, can I, can, I, can I go get lunch with you? And um, it was just interesting. He could, I could not schedule a lunch with this guy. He was so evasive. And he just, the more I kind of started pressing, the more nervous he got. So he's like, well, why do you want to meet with me so bad? And, and I'm just like, oh, I just want to chat. And he's like, well, what do you want to chat about? And I'm like, oh, I just want to chat. You know, some of my students were saying you know, this. And he's like, oh, okay, okay. So you want to talk about that issue? Like, yeah, sure. So he says, all right, come to my office at 8 o'clock. So I remember walk, walking uh, up to the, to, the, uh, to the room right outside of his office. And I'm just sitting there waiting, and then some, you know, secretary came and got me. And so I go into his office, and he's sitting there, and he's just, you know, like, as impersonal as you could possibly imagine. He's just behind his desk. He's got a three-ring binder open to his Sistheo two syllabus, to the very section where he's going to talk about the canonic heresy. And I just, I walked in there. We started chatting. I started, I just asked him, well, what do you believe? And just trying to understand where he was at. And I'm thinking, like, okay, surely we can reason here from the scriptures, and it became clear when I asked him, is Jesus God? And he, he almost choked on the G. He said, well, at some point, we would have to admit that Jesus is, is, and he was like voicing G, and he couldn't get the G out. And all he could get out was divine. And I was like, oh, okay. And I, was, I, knew, where, I knew where we were at, I knew we were at an impasse. I knew what I was dealing with. And he didn't, he didn't understand. And as soon as, as soon as I kind of dropped the issue, he just became best friends. And we just started chatting, chit-chatting. And I started finding out about his life. And I was just trying to figure out, where, where, where did this come from? Where, where do you go to church? Oh, I'll go to this church. My wife's the pastor. Okay. So how did you come to these... Conclusion, like from, like from Philippians. Oh, well, Philippians is actually where I got it and starts walking through the text. We go back to the text and he's just starting to, I just felt bad for the man. As we, sat, as we start walking through scripture, which is bulletproof, and realizing he has no answers, I just felt such a pity for him. One of the arguments dr- connects directly to this very passage. He says, Jesus' signs don't prove he's God any more than the apostles' signs prove they were God. The apostles healed. Paul raised Eutychus from the dead. Blind, fever, leprosy. Jesus did it, they did it. Those miracles don't prove you're God. That's not the point. The signs prove your message. Jesus' message is, I am God, and the apostles' message is, he is God. So both are correct. (laughs) Those miracles mean something. Namely, they attest to the message, and Jesus does not apologize for acting as God, performing a prerogative that belongs to God alone. He is forgiving sins, and he's not apologizing for it. If Jesus is lying here. He could not possibly heal this man of paralysis. Notice the word that Jesus uses here in verse 10. He says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. This is the first time this this phrase has been used in Mark, and it's a very important word. It's Jesus' most cherished term. What does it mean? It means son of man. It means you're human. So in Hebrew, if you said you're a son of something, you would use a descriptor. Uh, Sons of thunder means you're pretty intense, maybe pugnacious. Sons of thunder. Son of man means you're human. Son of God means you're divine, means you're God. That's what the term means. 
And here, Jesus, Jesus is not, he, he knows that the quarrel is not whether God has the right to forgive sins. The question is whether Jesus, as man, has the right to forgive sins. And he says, let me just show to you, let me prove to you that I, the man standing in front of you, have authority. Authority. The right and the power to forgive sin. This is not fiction, friends. This is not fiction. This is not Jesus acting like, wouldn't that be nice if there was that cosmic record of every crime you've ever committed against God and we could just somehow expunge the whole thing? Wouldn't that be cool? This isn't fiction. Every single crime this paralytic ever committed against God was wiped out by the sheer authority of Jesus Christ. He has that authority, he claims that authority, and he demonstrates it and proves it. By the way, let me just show you one more thing about the Son of Man. And this one, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not stealing Smith's thunder because he, 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 we got a ways before we get to Daniel 7, but we got to go here. Um, and by the way, as you're turning to Daniel 7, um, plug for Sunday nights, you all need to be there. Daniel is just so amazing, and it is such a sweet time. So um, take it even a little bit longer. I'll just say, I, I love, I love how, how valuable Sunday nights have been. I know not everybody can come. It's, I don't, this is not a guilt trip. But if, you're, if you haven't considered it, I would love to consider, every family would be sweet to consider, if you could be there, be a part of the fellowship, hear Smed preach the, the prophecy of Daniel. It is, it is so good and so rich. Okay, I'm already in then Daniel. I'll stop. Okay, Daniel chapter 7. I hope that was a sanctified sales pitch, but it was a sales pitch. I get it. <laughs> All right, Daniel 7, verse 13. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And this is different than other phrases, son of man. Ezekiel is called son of man over and over and over again because he's a prophet giving divine revelation, and God keeps calling him son of man. You're, 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 just, you're merely human. And here is a messianic prophecy of one who is the son of man. And he came up to the Ancient of Days, he was presented before him, and to the, this one like a son of man was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. This is an eternal, permanent kingdom. Skip down to verse 18. But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. And so this is a kingdom where there's going to be saints Saints who are holy, saints who are forgiven, saints who enjoy the glory, the reign, and the dominion of this one like a son of man. And it should not be surprising in the Great Commission in Matthew 28 that Jesus himself said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And so here we are, Mark 2, Simon Peter's house, paralytic, dropped through the demo work on the roof, and he cannot walk, he has no, he, he has no ability to move his limbs, and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. This is a heavenly cosmic declaration and he just wipes out all those crimes in this man's record and they say yeah right this man blasphemes and jesus says okay what's easier to say and so he turns around and says it to the man in verse 11 i say to you pick up get up pick up your pallet and go home and so if you want any question, if you have any question about Jesus' authority on earth to wipe out sin, I'm sorry, authority in heaven to wipe out sin, then here's his authority on earth to just absolutely eradicate paralysis. Verse 12, and he got up and immediately picked up the pallet. He went out in sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God saying, we've never seen anything like this. Verse 12 concludes the demonstration, the proof, the proof of Jesus' claim. His claim to forgive sins was not some empty, sacerdotal assertion. It was legit. We have in religious society often lost sight of the singular, exclusive authority of the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive sin. We've tried to give that authority to men so that men can forgive others. A notable example of that would be the Roman Catholic Church 
in the Council of Trent in 1545 to 1563. They wrote the, the following. This is still official Roman Catholic dogma. Canon 9, particularly on the sacrament of absolution, where a priest actually renounces someone's sins and pronounces them forgiven, they said this, If anyone saith that the, sa the sacramental absolution of the priest is not a judicial act, but a bare ministry of pronouncing and declaring sins to be forgiven to him who confesses, providing only he believes himself to be absolved, or even though the priest absolved not in earnest but in joke, or saith that the confession of the penitent is not required in order that the priest may be able to absolve him, let him be anathema. Well, that's a mouthful, but that means that basically if a priest is ordained in the Roman Catholic Church, even if he wasn't in earnest, even if he pronounced an absolution of sins and he was only joking around, even if he wasn't sincere in the proclamation, it's still legit. And if you deny that, then you are condemned. Anathema means condemned, uh, worthy of perdition and condemnation in hell. That's canon 9. I remember going to a college chapel at the same school where I had talked to that professor. I used to, I used to speak in their chapels uh, every semester. That, that ended quickly. Um, but uh, our, our, my senior pastor uh, kind of snuck through the filter, uh, secretary of the, 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 the guy who was scheduling the uh, chapel speakers. You know, he just said, here, fill in these three weeks, and, and somehow he got in without, without them knowing it. Next thing I know, he's preaching this incredible sermon on Luke 7 about the sinful woman, he who is forgiven much, loves much. He sat down. At the end of chapel, the professor who was overseeing the chapel, and this is, this is on paper, they claim to be a Protestant college. The professor overseeing the chapel raised his hand and said, now students go in peace, your sins are forgiven. With that, the chapel was over. It, it was an absolution without works, it was an absolution without faith, it was just sheer assertion. I wish I had had the wherewithal. I was flabbergasted. My jaw was on the floor. I'd never seen anything like that in that kind of context before. If I'd had my senses, I would have liked to have thought that I would have just, you know, used some self-control and stood up and shouted heresy or something, but I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know what I would have done. <laughs> That's an extreme example. What's not so extreme, though, is what you see today in our culture. Just, just uh, in the last couple of weeks, uh, thinking about this text, uh, I was watching some, some show with, uh, with my family, and the main character is having a real dilemma. You know, it's like this, the pinnacle of the tension in the, in the story, and a family member is speaking to the, to the main character of the movie with these very common words. This could be about a, a hundred stories uh, told. This is like a hundred conversations in anyone's week. The family member says to the main character, well, your problem is you need to forgive yourself. We give the authority to forgive to other men, to forgive other people. We give it to ourselves. Forgive yourself? I mean, we, when we hear that, we ought to be thinking, what in the wide world of blasphemy is that? Do you realize what you're saying? Who am I to be able to forgive myself? Who do you think I am? And is my sin even against myself? My sin's against God, and I don't even have the authority to forgive either one even if I could somehow fictionally sin against myself. We have lost our bearings. And here comes Christ with this otherworldly authority, the authority to forgive sins. We finished the story, but I want to make one more comment, because what Mark is doing with this story, where he puts it, is also important. And you know this is the beginning of the um, conflict narratives where the conflict with the religious leaders is increasing. We see it here in this story in verse 6 and 7, and it's silent and it's unarticulated. In verses 13 to 17, they start to question Jesus verbally, but not directly, to his disciples. So it's kind of a backhanded way to start expressing their hostility. In verses 18 to 22, they start talking to Jesus directly, but they start just by asking him questions. They try to couch their unbelief in questions. And then in verses 23 to 27, they start flat out rebuking him. 
And then in chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, they plot his murder. They begin looking for a way to execute Christ. They want to murder him. Mark is, Mark is starting the hostility narratives with this story. And the question that I want us to all ask this morning is, what makes the difference between how we respond to this story? There was a lot of people there. They were all amazed. They were astounded. They are staggered at what they saw. And even when Mark says they were glorifying God, they, were, they certainly were recognizing, man, this is something supernatural. I wouldn't put that in the category of the same thing as like, you know, some sort of conversion. Uh, they're, 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 they're pretty staggered. They, they know that God did it. They are Orthodox Jews. But that's much different than saying, you know, they glorified Jesus. This is a popular level response. And it's the beginning of the hostility of the religious leaders. The, the religious leaders are hearing this authority to forgive and they are they just view it as blasphemy. The difference between them and a proper response to this story is knowing your sin. Knowing your sin. Let me speak to you not as a role, not as dads and moms, not as husbands and wives, not as children, not as workers, employees, members of a church, Christians, unchristian, non-Christians, unbelievers. It doesn't, I, I'm not speaking to you according to any role or hat that you might wear. Let me speak to you as sinner. If, if you know your sins, if your sins are ever before you, if you know that your sins are against God and against God only, then you know from this story what's more amazing and what's more profound than the fact that Jesus would heal disabled limbs is the healing of a depraved soul. It's not the removal of paralysis. It's the removal of guilt. It's not the giving of physical ability, but the giving of spiritual ability. Jesus just took stains on the cosmic mosaic of this man's um, record Stains that cannot be removed by anyone but God. And he single-handedly just wiped those stains away. That's authority. That's authority in heaven. Jesus is the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. He's the son of God and the son of man. And so, sinners, sinners like you and me, we got to go to Christ. He's the only one with authority to forgive us. He's the only one who can solve our dilemma. We will either take offense at him and maybe even merely enjoy the amazement of his wonder-working ability, or else we will worship him because of his ability to forgive sins. If we take offense at that, we, we die in our sin. If we go to him and submit to his authority and faith and repentance and brokenness, brokenness over the fact that our, our sin certainly does reflect the attempt to spite God in our heart, and then we know that we find in Christ the only one who can wipe out our sin. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that you sent your Son and that you gave your Son all authority in heaven and on earth. And in this story, Lord, we are shown once again without any possible doubt that your son has authority to forgive sin, to remove it, to cover, to cover the offense and to remove the guilt and to even satisfy, Father, your wrath against that sin as we'll even see in coming chapters. But to think that your son holds authority to forgive Father, where else would we go but to, to you and to your son? You are the forgiving God, and your son holds that authority to forgive. And so I, I just want to even um, pray this morning for any, any who are here who, who are not forgiven. I, I pray that they would go straight to Jesus Christ right now, that they would go straight to your son. He certainly died, but he is not dead. He lives forever in glorified, resurrected body. 
He has always been God. He became man, and he will exist with divine nature and human nature for eternity future. And I pray that that sinner would now fly to Christ in his own heart with brokenness, with contrition, knowing that he deserves all that was described in Isaiah 1, knowing that he has done what is wicked and guilty, knowing that he, is, he has not feared you, the dread of you is not in him, and the only hope is for forgiveness of sins. Those sins must be wiped out or whoever it is will carry them with them all the way to judgment. And Lord, I just want to even lead um, all of your children in prayer. We just come before you overwhelmed with gratitude. Our sin is ever before us and we see it regularly and we see it constantly and we are so thankful that you have this authority we're thankful that you 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 have this is not fiction you have the actual authority to wipe out our sin to do it even in a just way because of the gospel and we're overwhelmed at that authority i pray that we would never forget it i pray that we would always live at the feet of the cross that we would always live worshiping your son and worshiping you father and so all of your children this morning, we, we, are, we are overwhelmed once again at the perfection and the glory and the authority of your Son. I pray that he would be glorified in us as we sing this song, as we sing these lyrics to you. I pray that you would be pleased with our worship. In your name we pray. Amen.